mind goes back to that stormy night when just in time. the light from that old lighthouse that stands up there on the hill and I thank God for the lighthouse I owe my life to him for Jesus is the lighthouse and from Well, good morning, everyone. This is Pastor Marley here from Alconbury Independent Baptist Church. A warm welcome to you all, especially as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, it's Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. It's a day when Christians, true Christians throughout the world, rejoice that our Savior has risen from the dead. However, every Lord's Day should be a day of celebration, remembering that he rose again on the first day of the week. And I'm just going to open our service by reading a few verses from God's Word uh, to set our hearts for worship. It's always important to turn to the Word of God. And we're turning to a well-known passage of Scripture. And it's in Matthew, Mark chapter 16. Mark this text, friends. Mark chapter 16, and when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, who shall roll, roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulchre? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And then in verse 6, And he saith unto them, that's the man, the angel in white clothing, Be not affrighted, ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen, he is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. He is not here, he is risen. Behold the place where they laid him laid him. Let us bow our heads in a word of prayer. Our God and our Father, we are so grateful to be gathered in the presence of the Lord this morning, remembering our dear Savior's resurrection from the dead. And we pray thy blessing upon each and every one of us, those in our homes, those who are secure, those who are in hospital, those who are 
Conscious of the presence of the Lord, come down, O Lord, and visit every home and every heart, from the youngest to the oldest, from the opening prayer to the end of the service. May God be praised. May Christ be exalted. May we all be encouraged to seek after Christ and to know more of his power, his grace, and his glory. We ask these mercies in Christ's name. Amen. And our opening reading this morning is found in John's Gospel, chapter 19. John's Gospel and chapter 19. Of course, if you were with us on Friday morning for our Good Friday service, we are in John chapter 19, and perhaps you're wondering what happened next after the Lord Jesus Christ yielded up the ghost. Well, the soldiers came and they pierced the, they broke the limbs of the, of the thieves that were with Jesus, and then they pierced the Savior's side. And we pick up our reading in verse 38. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus, and wound it in linen cloths with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, And in the garden a new sepulchre, wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulchre was nigh at hand. And Jesus was in the tomb, as we know, three days and three nights. And then on the first day of the week, in chapter 20, verse 1, cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre. We know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and the other disciple, and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulchre. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths, lying yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulchre, and seeth the linen cloths lying, and the napkin that was about his head, and not lying with the linen cloths, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went also the other disciple, which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and Believed, for as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. And the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his word. And now we're going to have a, a hymn. We're just going to put the words up on the screen for you. It's coming, I'm sure. We tried to find a resurrection hymn. Pass me not, O gentle Saviour. Thank you.
Of course, that was our good friend and dear brother in the Lord, Pastor Covington. Pass me not, O gentle Saviour. And indeed, if you're a Christian here this morning, the Saviour has not passed you by. He has brought you into his sheepfold. He is the shepherd of his beloved sheep. If you're not yet a Christian, then the Saviour has not passed you by either because you're listening in, you're listening to the Word of God, and we trust that your soul would be blessed And you will know the presence of the Lord, of the shepherd himself, as you worship with us together. Just a few notices to um, share with you, friends. Uh, First of all, um, this recording, of course, will be uploaded to our YouTube channel after this um, broadcast. And if you've got friends um, that are interested in more of hearing the gospel, then please uh, direct them to that YouTube channel. On Wednesday evening, we will return with our series on Keeping the Faith. Again, that will be a study, um, study four, part four of our series, and we will be uploading that to YouTube later. That will be the conclusion of the first chapter of 2 Timothy and chapter one. And then, of course, if you're part of our regular congregation and membership of the church, we have the Zoom prayer meeting. Uh, For those who are interested, we'll send a a link uh, to you. Um, Those of you who have already received the link will know that it's 6.30 to 7.30 every Wednesday evening. If someone is interested in the Christian faith and you have uh, questions, please get in touch. You can find all our details on our website. Of course, that will be on our Facebook page as well. If you're interested in receiving a Bible, please get in touch, or in fact, if there's anything we can help you practically with, uh, please uh, contact us on either our telephone number or through our email on our website. And the Lord, we pray and trust, will continue to be with us all. These notices are in the will of the Lord. We know the Lord is in sovereign control of all. As our Bible tells us, He is the one who ruleth over all, and we entrust all our needs and all our cares to him. Before we come to the message this morning, we're now going to have a time of prayer, and we're going to pray for our country. We're going to thank the Lord for the recovery of our Prime Minister, and that is an answer to prayer. Many Christians have been praying throughout the country, and indeed throughout the world, 
for our Prime Minister, Mr Johnson, over the last weeks. And we're thankful to say that the Lord has brought him out of intensive care, uh, but he's still at hosp in hospital. So we pray for him and the medical staff who are caring for him. We also remember those in government, uh, those who are like uh, Mr. Rabb, who's his first secretary, and the cabinet. We pray for those in the health care service, but we also pray for those in frontline key services. And we're thankful to the Lord for them. We remember our missionaries. And we'll also, of course, remember any needs in our congregation. So let us bow our heads in a word of prayer. Oh, Father, what a blessing it is to be able to say this morning that we can come before the throne of God's grace. That we can bow in the presence of Almighty God. That our God is not restricted. The word of Truth is not restricted. The gospel is not restricted. Lord, we may find ourselves restricted. We may find ourselves detained in our homes. But Lord, we know that the gospel is freed and it is able to be broadcast throughout the world. We thank thee, O Lord, for hearing our prayers over this past week for our own members of our congregation. And we thank thee, Lord, for thy Spirit's work in our lives. We pray, Lord, that even through these days we would draw a little nearer to the Saviour. We would give up on our old habits that have directed our thoughts and our minds and our souls away from thee. Lord, thou hast removed so much from us, so much entertainment and so much distraction. So help us as thy people to know thy grace and thy love and thy mercy in a greater and fuller way. We thank thee, O Lord, that we can say this morning, our Saviour has not passed us by. That when he died on the cross of Calvary and he declared the work of redemption, it is finished. And he yielded up the ghost. So our Saviour, though dying on that cross, was buried in the tomb, has gloriously risen from the dead. The angels declared he is not here. He is risen. Come and see where the Lord lay. The apostles beheld the empty tomb. Mary Magdalene himself saw the risen Christ. There were two disciples on the road to Emmaus who were fellowshipping with the risen Lord Jesus and yet they didn't even recognize it until he broke bread with them. Uh, there was the apostles who beheld Christ and that upper room. They were in distress and they were distraught and they were, they were so overwhelmed by all the events. And Christ appeared and he says, Shalom, peace be unto you. And we know, Lord, that 500 saw our Savior all at one time. Because the Bible is so clear that the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ is the very grounds of our confidence in our salvation. The very grounds on which we can say Christ has saved us because Christ has risen from the dead. We thank thee, O Lord, that we can say this morning to all who would listen that Christ is risen from the dead indeed. And because he's risen, we can face tomorrow. We can face next week. We can face next month. We can say with confidence no matter what befalls us. Because Christ is our Savior. Our risen, resurrected Savior. Therefore we can say the Lord is with us. And that to bless us. O oh Lord we pray this morning for those in need in our, in our community and in our country. We thank thee Lord for answers to prayer regarding our Prime Minister and his recovery of health. We pray, O oh Lord, in thanksgiving for others who have recently recovered from uh, this COVID-19 virus and their Lord making a good recovery. We thank the Lord for the staff in the various hospitals, not just the, the doctors and the nurses, but all the staff, the, the staff clerks, the hospital clerks, all those involved and even the cleaners, Lord. We're thankful for all those who are associated with our NHS and our healthcare systems. We also remember those in the community. We pray again, Lord, for our police that they'll be given wisdom and a balance to be able to marshal the, the situation in a, in a kind and, and consent, in, in a way that will um, bring forth the most cohesion in this, in this country at this time. We pray, Lord, for those involved in delivery uh, and in retail and in uh, 
food distribution and food production. Lord, we pray for them all. Keep them and preserve them. We pray, Lord, for churches this morning where the gospel will be preached, where people do believe that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, that they actually do believe that these truths cannot be refuted. Oh, we pray for many, Lord, who are unbelieving this morning, who don't believe in the risen Christ, who, who hear of the empty tomb and mock it. May they realize, Lord, they're not mocking us. They're mocking Christ. They're mocking the truth of God's word. They're denying the very truth that we hold so dear. But worse than that, they're defying the truth of God. And they, O oh Lord, are turning their back on him. O oh God, be merciful. O oh, in this land at this time, please, Lord, bring many to understand that Christianity is not about religious practices. It's all about Jesus Christ. His life, his perfect life. His death, his atoning death. His glorious resurrection from the dead. And his ascension into glory. And Lord, we know that because Christ is risen from the dead, then when he said about his second coming, it's true as well. And so we pray, Lord, prepare us for that day. We know one day some of us may hear the voice of Christ himself as many waters. We pray, Lord, for those who are involved in our congregation in serving the community and serving a gospel work. We pray, Father, for those who are serving in frontline areas, and we pray, Lord, draw near to each one. We pray for friends and family who are unwell, who are at home. We pray for those who are bereaved this morning, Lord. We pray, Lord, draw near to them, encourage them, strengthen them, uphold them we pray for the richards family lord our dear brother has gone home to glory but lord he is now in the savior's presence oh god we pray for the whole family at this time and we pray draw so near to them that they could say the lord has come and that to bless us oh father we pray for our missionaries we pray for the boothbys we thank thee for them we thank thee that they're back in chesterfield and they're safe but we pray, Lord, thy blessing upon them and encourage them. Paul and Susan, let's prepare uh, for ministry. Lord, maybe, the, Lord, in time, thou wilt bring them back to Papua New Guinea. And Lord, we pray, bring them back stronger and more healthy and even more of, on fire and revived in the gospel. Father, we pray for the work in Papua New Guinea. We pray that it would grow and increase and abound and those in leadership will be helped greatly. Father, most of all, we pray for those who are seeking Christ. And we pray, Lord, this morning that when we visit the empty tomb, they would see that the tomb is empty, the cross is empty, but Christ is able to save them from their sins. Draw near to us now. Speak to our hearts. We beseech thee in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Well, I did mention that Brother Bob Richards has gone home to be with the Lord, and we're praying much for the family at this time. Would you turn with me to John chapter 19? Uh, John chapter 19. And the title of our message this morning is The Empty Tomb. John chapter 19. Of course, it's resurrection morning. And Easter 2020 will never be forgotten. It will be etched in our memories, the remembrance that Jesus Christ rose from the dead on that first Easter morning was similarly never etched from the memories of those who were witnesses. Those like the apostles who went to the empty tomb, those women like Mary Magdalene who saw the risen Christ. All of the disciples who beheld Christ on that evening of the first resurrection day. And I want us this morning to think seriously about the empty tomb. Maybe you think this is going to be a, a heavy message or a, a morose message. I've been told recently by someone quite young that I should smile more. Well, I have every reason to smile this morning. This is the most glorious story. This is a true story. Dare I say it's not even a story. It's an account. It's an, a witness account, an eyewitness account of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. An eyewitness account from John's own pen. 
the facts about the empty tomb. And I've got a list of them here, and I trust as they, we go through them that the Holy Spirit will bless them to your soul. Seven facts of the empty tomb. The picture before you is of the tomb in Jerusalem. Now, if you ever have the opportunity to visit Jerusalem and to see the, the important sites, I have to say, recently I was privileged to be there, and some of you are aware also, and there we ignored all the usual religious sites like the Hagia, like the, 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 the Temple Mount and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and all these places. We went to the place called the Garden Tomb. And there in that garden tomb, according to testimony, archaeological evidence that the tomb that people believe that Jesus may have been laid in for three days can actually be traced back to the time of Jesus. There is a garden. There is a tomb. It's a Jewish tomb. It's a garden tomb. It's a tomb that has certain markings in it. But just 300 yards away is another significant place that is called Golgotha. And we looked at the Golgotha on Friday morning. Golgotha is another name for Calvary. So within the space of a few hundred yards are two of the most significant sites in biblical Christianity. And what we're going to discover this morning are seven things about, seven facts about the empty tomb and then a, a few points of application. I want us to turn to John chapter 19 and verse 41. Now in the place where he was crucified, that of course is the Lord Jesus Christ who was crucified. That means he was put on a cross. He was put on a cross. He was nailed to a cross by the soldiers and he was hung up for those six hours on the cross. Between his hands and his feet were these six inch nails nailed into his hands and his feet. And in the garden a new sepulcher wherein never was man yet laid. There laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day. Did you notice that? They laid him in a sepulchre. The sepulchre was in a garden. The garden was not far from Golgotha. And I want us to think, first of all, of the fact that it was a Jewish tomb. It was a Jewish tomb. Now, in the West... We bury our dead loved ones in graves. Or sometimes people are cremated and then their ashes are scattered. But not the Jews. The Jews do not bury their dead in graves in the soil, six foot under. No, they entomb their loved ones. And these are called sepulchres. And if you notice, John mentions this word, in verse 41, in the garden was a new sepulchre. And earlier on in, in other parts of scripture, in John chapter 20 and verse 2 and John chapter 20 and verse 3, we also have this word when Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb, we are told it's a sepulchre. Twice the word is used in verse 1 and again in verse 2. The sepulchre. What is this sepulchre? Verse 3, sorry. Sepulchre is a tomb. It's not a grave. And mostly the Jews, especially the wealthy Jews, would use tombs or caves. The poor people who couldn't afford to have a tomb were buried in vertical shafts, in a field. And of course, many of you know the reference to the potter's field. But what happened? 
They have this tomb and they have this body. Well, the first thing they would have done first was they would have washed the body. And then they would have embalmed the body. They would have used spices like spikenard or nard for short. Do you remember the woman in Simon's house who anointed Jesus' head and feet? And Jesus said, she has anointed me for my burial. This use of expensive fragrances was not spared on the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then they took the body and laid it lovingly and wrapped it in linen cloths. We read about those linen cloths in the passage early in the scriptures when the disciples look into the tomb. What do they see? They see linen cloths. These would have been wrapped around the body of our Lord Jesus. And then the body was laid on a shelf. Now I need to just remind you that the tombs of the Jews, especially the rich Jews, was usually a cave with two, two chambers. The first was a chamber which could hold about four or five people. The second chamber, which was usually on the right, had three shelves. And when the disciples came to the tomb on that first morning, they could not see the two shelves on the right-hand side because they're in behind the wall. But they could see the shelf at the very far end of the wall. And that's why they can look in and see that there's nobody there. Or if you like, nobody there. And we need to remember that when we come to this account. That Jesus Christ rose from the dead is testified by this eyewitness account. But the tomb itself shows us that when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, he left a napkin separate from the linen cloths. And the disciples could see these things. Later, of course, they would see him who had been wearing these grave clothes. So this was a Jewish tomb because Jesus Christ was a Jew. Do you remember what Pilate had written above him as we looked on Friday? This is the Jesus, the King of the Jews. Jesus Christ was the King of the Jews. But friends, he was also the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And today he's not the King of the Jews only, believing Jews. But he's King of those people throughout the world, Jew or Gentile, who've trusted in him as their saviour. So that's the first thing. It was a Jewish tomb. The second thing is, and this will be briefer, it was a rich man's tomb. It was a rich man's tomb. Who was Joseph of Arimathea? Who was he? Well, he was a rich man. In Matthew chapter 27 and verse 27, we are told that this man was rich, wealthy, well-to-do. He had lots of spare coinage, if you like. They didn't deal in credit cards in those days. They didn't have such things. But he had lots of money at his disposal. We know he was a rich man because he could afford to have a family tomb. And he didn't, of course, dig the tomb himself. He didn't carve out the cave for himself. He got someone else to do it. He was a rich man. And he was a rich man who was a secret disciple of our Lord Jesus. Now this is important because only someone who was rich could afford a tomb like this. The poor, as I mentioned earlier, were buried in vertical shafts and fields. Do you remember the reference to the potter's field in Matthew 27 and verse 7? So what usually happened, the rich paid others to carve out their family tombs. Do you remember that Joseph owned this tomb? But he did not do the work himself. He had hired laborers. He was wealthy. There was another man who was very wealthy back in the days of Pharaoh of Egypt. His name began with J. His name was Joseph. And Joseph, of course, died in Egypt. 
But he said to his family, and Moses Remember these words, when thou leavest the land, take my bones with thee. That's in Genesis chapter 50. Now why is that important? Because Joseph, being a Jew, was buried as a Jew. And as a rich man, he could afford to have a sepulcher. And as a rich man, he could give instructions that would be carried out hundreds of years later. You see, what happened in the tomb was this. The person would decay, but then the bodies would be taken and lovingly put in an ossuary. And they then would be carried and put in a special place. And so it is with our Lord Jesus Christ. But they didn't need an ossuary. They didn't need to wait a time. No, because Jesus Christ only needed this rich man's tomb for a very short time. You see, God had planned it all. And I love the fact that a Bible has details like it was a new tomb where no man laid. More of that in a moment. What does that mean for us? It means that God Almighty had already planned for one of his own children, Joseph of Arimathea, to have a tomb built, he thought, for his family. But actually... It was for his saviour. The third thing is it was a new tomb. In, in Matthew 27 verse 60, the Bible says, Joseph of Arimathea put him in his own new tomb. In Luke 23 and verse 53, wherein we are told more details, wherein never man before was laid. In John chapter 19 and verse 41, we are told, wherein was never man yet laid. It was a new tomb, friends. It was a tomb that no one had ever occupied. It was a tomb that had freshly been carved. It was a tomb that was perfectly suited for the Savior. Is it not extraordinary that the one who owns the universe, the one who, who, to whom all of us owe our very life and existence, the one who upholds the stars in his hands, the one who names them, each one by one, this one didn't have his own tomb to be buried in. He needed to borrow one. But it was a new tomb. And what a challenge to us is this, because Joseph, we are told, was a secret disciple. We'll see more of this detail in a moment. In Matthew's Gospel, we are told he was a secret disciple. He was one who was expecting the kingdom to come, the kingdom of God to appear. He was expecting the king to arrive. He was a secret disciple in the fact that he hadn't publicly testified to the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you, friend, publicly, have you got a, a secret love for the Lord and nobody else knows about it? Well, the Lord may be drawing you to himself this morning. He may even be encouraging you to say, tell others. That you believe in Jesus Christ who died on the cross on Good Friday and he's risen from the dead and he's your saviour this morning. It was not only a Jewish tomb, nor was it a rich man's tomb. It was a new tomb. Fourthly, it was a well-known tomb. Now, Joseph of Arimathea was very well known. He was one of the Sanhedrin. He was one of those ruling council. He was a very devout Jew. And he was well known because most people in Jerusalem knew who was in charge. Uh, just like us today, we know the name of our mayor. Perhaps you don't have a mayor in your town, but you know the people that are important. And everybody in Jerusalem would have known who Joseph Arimathea was. Arimathea itself is situated about 20 miles northwest of Jerusalem. So that region, which is now called Zophim, was a place where Joseph of Arimathea had come from. He was well known, he was rich, he was religious. And as I hinted, he was also a disciple of Jesus. Everybody would have known where this tomb was. And if, you, if I take you back to that picture of the garden tomb, it's probably only about 500 to 600 yards from the wall, the external wall of the city of Jerusalem. And therefore, 
when Peter was preaching on Pentecost and declaring that God had raised him from the dead in Acts chapter 2 and verse 43. He could have said to someone, you go down to the tomb, you go and find the body of Jesus and prove my preaching wrong. You've got the time. But no one did because there was nobody in that tomb. It was a well-known tomb. And yet, fifthly, it was also a garden tomb. And I love this in John's Gospel. And that's why I chose to read from John this morning. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new sepulchre, wherein never was man laid. It was a garden, friends. It was a place of growth where there were trees. If you go there today, you'll see trees. It's quite cool. It's quite shaded. Now, of course, because of tourism, there's lots of paths through it. But in the days of our Lord, there would have been a lot more trees, like olive trees and other trees like that. And what a thing it is. Our dear Lord Jesus, who visited our first parents in the Garden of Eden, was buried in the garden outside the city walls of Jerusalem. It was a garden tomb. It was a tomb that was fit for the king. And indeed, it was a tomb that was found in a garden not far from Golgotha. Just one or two more points, and then we'll come quickly to conclusion, to application but I just want you to notice this. It was a borrowed tomb. It was borrowed. The Lord Jesus only needed it for a few days. A matter of three days is all he needed this tomb for. It was a tomb that was borrowed from one of his own disciples. Now, of course, the Lord Jesus had orchestrated all of this. And he had been working in people's hearts and maybe... Joseph of Arimathea and another man brought Jesus' body and laid it in the tomb. Look at verse 39. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh, aloes, and about a hundred pound weight. So in verse 38, we have one disciple, Joseph of Arimathea. In verse 39, we have another disciple, Nicodemus. Do you remember Nicodemus coming to Jesus in John chapter 3 and Jesus told him that he needed to be born again? And Nicodemus, if you like, scratched his head and said, what do you mean by that? I don't understand it. To, in, to himself, Jesus knew exactly what he was thinking. And he says, Nicodemus said, can a man enter into his mother's womb twice? And the answer, of course, is no. Imagine a six-foot man or a five-foot man trying to get into that kind of space. But Jesus wasn't talking about physical birth. He was talking about spiritual birth. And how important that is. That Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea here prove that they're disciples of Jesus Christ. They have been born again. They are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ borrowed this tomb from Joseph of Arimathea for the matter of three days. Oh, friends, Jesus borrowed it from Mar Joseph of Arimathea. I'm sure Joseph of Arimathea was indebted to the Lord Jesus for the rest of his days. I believe he's in glory. But what about us? We don't need to, as it were, offer a, a tomb for the Lord to be buried in, but we can offer our time and our talents and our services, even though we might be restricted. We can always say a word for the Savior with people on our walks. You're walking out with your dog. Share something of Christ with these people. They need hope. They need encouragement. They need to have their hearts lifted up and to be thinking about their never dying souls. There's a sixth thing I want you to think about. It was sealed. In Matthew 27, verse 60, a great stone was rolled upon the door of the sepulchre. Of course, that's the very same stone that was rolled away when Mary, that Mary's visited the tomb on that first morning. A stone. Now, it would have been whitewashed. 
And how do I know that? Well, the custom was that you whitewashed the tomb so that everybody knew it was a burial site. And so this stone had, which had been washed away, rolled away, was now left, as it were, on the side. So that anybody who came up to the tomb could look into it. But the last thing, and the most important, if you like, it was a vacant tomb. Jesus Christ told his disciples in Mark chapter 8, verse 31, and Mark 10 and verse 34, that he would rise from the dead. That indeed, Jesus Christ, as we are told in Acts 2 and verse 24, God hath raised him from the dead. In Psalm 16 and verse 10, I believe, is the scripture that speaks of, Thou wilt not let thine holy one to see corruption. There was no body there. There was only the remains of a burial site, of, of a napkin and of the cloth, the linen cloth that had been wound around the Lord's body. But there was no body there. It was vacant. And what a thing that is to, to think about this morning. Our Savior was laid in that tomb for just a matter of a few days and it was emptied on that first Sunday morning, on that first resurrection morning. Indeed, the angels testified to it and the disciples testified to it and the women testified to it and in John in Paul's writings he testifies to meeting the risen Christ he even records for us in 1 Corinthians 15 that 500 saw him at once 500 now you could hallucinate with five or six but you can't hallucinate with 500 people There's no such thing as that, friends. No, those who don't believe in the resurrection are in great trouble. They are are refuting the very facts of God's word. They are denying the very heart of the gospel. They are ignoring the evidence of the empty tomb. They won't read the text and read it for themselves. There are people this morning, sadly, that are religious, but they don't believe in the risen Christ. There are people who are important religious figures and they deny the resurrection. Friends, there's no hope for them. There's no mercy for them. There's no forgiveness for them. If they don't believe in the risen Christ, then they can't be Christians. And that's tragic. So instead of being judgmental, let's be prayerful. Let's pray for them. Let's pray for a great work of God in people's hearts and lives. Let's pray that the hope of the resurrection will so transform people's minds and souls. Let's pray that when we think of Christ rising from the dead, we would never be morose and miserable again. We have so much to be thankful for. We have so much to be grateful for. We have so much to be encouraged in as we study the word of God. Let me share these applications. They're very sharp, very brief, because I know we're out of time, but five assurances. They, this resurrection, the empty tomb, proves Christ's death happened. How do we know that? Because, of course, the disciples and the women who went to the tomb were expecting to find a body. But there was no body. Jesus Christ's death did happen because they were expecting to find a body there. But the second thing is this, and uh, we're just going to prove, it proves that we can trust Christ's own words. Thirdly, we ca- it proves that God justifies the ungodly. God justifies the ungodly. God declares the ungodly forgiven on the basis of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. You can trust Christ's words. If you've never read the Bible, let me encourage you this morning, open it in John chapter 1 and read right through over the next few weeks and ponder and think to yourself, Christ is speaking here again and again. His words were recorded, therefore we can trust them. He said before he was in Jerusalem for the last week of his life, he said that he would be taken, he will be betrayed, he will be handed over, and he will be crucified. But on the third day, he'd rise from the dead. Christ was raised from the dead 
to verify God's word and to prove to all of his people that God justifies the ungodly. Fourthly, it proves Christ is alive today. And fifthly, it proves that Christ is able to save us. He's able to save us. I had so many hymns I could have chosen this morning, but for various reasons, as you know, we're struggling to find some um, suitable um, material. But I thought of Christ the Lord is risen today. I thought of the, the words, Lo, in the grave he lay, Jesus my Saviour. He rolled the stone away, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose, with a mighty triumph over his foes. He arose the victor from the dark domain, and he ever lives with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah. How he arose. What does it mean for hallelujah? It means praise the Lord. And how wonderful we can do that this morning. Praising the Lord. Let's sing hallelujah. It proves that Christ is able to save us. To redeem us. To pardon us. To cleanse us. Because he's alive at this very moment. And he is praying right now for all of his church throughout the world. Every single believer is on the Savior's heart and every one of their needs are on the Savior's lips. But just three challenges to leave you with this morning. Will you believe, sadly, many people will lie today in the name of religion? Or will you believe in God's truth, his holy word? His infallible word. His trustworthy word. When you read about the risen Christ. God testified that he would raise his son from the dead. Even at the end of Isaiah 53. Read it later. He shall see the travail of his soul. That proves that he rose from the dead. But here's another one. Job chapter 19 and verse 25. I know that my Redeemer liveth. I know there's another sermon in that. But what a joy that is. Believe God's word. The word of God is true and reliable and trustworthy. And the resurrection testifies to that. Secondly, will you look to the risen Christ this morning for salvation? For your salvation. Friend, don't trust in the broken reed of religion. Or the broken reed of philosophy. Or the broken reed of hedonism and pleasure seeking. Or the bro broken reed of living for yourself. Because all of those things are empty. Trust in the risen Christ. The reigning Christ. The glorious risen Christ. And trust in him for your salvation. He's able to save you now. And you say, well I'm not a church. That's fine. God is not limited. He doesn't need to appear in a church building to save someone. Christ doesn't need to come, visit, come to somebody in the church building. That's the only place they can be saved. No, friends, don't believe that. You can be saved right now in your living room, in your bedroom. If you'll turn your heart to the Lord, if you'll repent of your sins, if you'll give up your false convictions and your false life, if you'll give up your hypocrisy and trust in him, he will save you right now. The third thing and finally is this. Will you prepare yourselves for his second coming? Because, friends, all that's happening at the moment is just the beginnings of sorrows. Or as another place puts it, the birth pangs. These are, these are occasions where God is shaking up the situation and shaking up the world. But we need to prepare for Christ's second coming. Because as he rose from the dead and he appeared to his disciples, he has ascended unto glory in Acts chapter 1. And he will return in all power and splendor and majesty. Are you ready? Are you trusting in the risen Christ this morning? Well, what a thing it is to be saved this morning. What a thing it is to belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. What a thing it is to be able to say, I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he has risen from the dead. Let me leave you with this little phrase. The resurrection is not the result of the empty tomb, but the empty tomb is the result 
of the resurrection. That was said by Mr. Sproul, a godly man many years ago. I wonder, friends, do you believe Christ rose from the dead? Peter, Stephen, all the early preachers, all the men of God throughout the ages have believed in the life and the death, the burial and the glorious resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Come to him this morning. He, as it were, who died on Good Friday, only was in the tomb for three days and he rose from the dead. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. He arose the victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose. Hallelujah. Christ arose. Let us bow in a word of prayer. Father, we're so thankful for this morning. We thank thee for all thy mercies. Bless us, O Lord, this day, on this first day of the week, but also on this day we can remember our Saviour's wonderful resurrection. O Lord, may he become all the more dear to us, may he become all the more nearer to us. Draw us a little closer to the Saviour. Draw near to us now, each and every one. Bless our souls, our hearts, our families, our homes. Oh, that many would come to trust in the risen Saviour, our precious Saviour, Jesus Christ. And Lord, if there's anyone that's wrestling with these truths and hasn't quite grasped the enormity and the wonder and the glory of the resurrection, oh Lord, this morning, visit their souls. Show them they can have their sins forgiven. They can have new life. They can have pardon and peace with God. Show them, oh Lord, that thou art very near them at this moment. Draw near to each one. Part us with thy blessing. In Christ's name, amen. sins and grief to bear.